and said kind of you wanted to say something what would you say and they just said increase in complexity and increase in request for uh what's called a referral meaning take a look at a child because we're concerned you're coming from staff or parents and that was more than doubled in most of our buildings at the point for example at the high school they were had 13 referrals before we went to winter break we usually have that many in a year um and i got same information for most buildings are seeing that increase in referrals that those don't always lead to evaluations and identifications but it certainly is showing an increasing concern for students <laughs> Any other questions about the special ed? I mean, the um, uh, system psychologist. Yes, Liz. Um, I just wanted to follow up with the BCBA. Um, so you are looking to add a BCBA, and, yeah. and what's the difference between adding and contracting out? Is there any sort of cost benefit to contracting out, or the BCBA is more available if we contract out? We are currently contracting out just to cover the services that are in IEPs. And we're at the tipping point where when we figured out how many hours it is actually more cost effective to get one internally than the cost that we're spending additionally i'm trying to create a peer group of the psychologists and the bcbas internally that they can problem solve and create systems for behavioral support when you have a contracted service it's harder to do that because you're not working internally with your own staff uh, but right now our cost for contracting out is actually outweighing the cost of what it would cost to get an internal bca Pip, did you have a question? Yeah, and I think we may have asked you this already, but um, I know there haven't been any applications, or at least last time there hadn't been any applications for that position. Um, is there any evidence that would suggest that raising the salary for that position would bring us more candidates? We are in competition with, for example, year-round schools like Birch Tree Center that have um, many BCBA on staff, and they're because they're a year-round school, they pay at a higher rate. Our BCBAs right now are on teacher salary, so we are limited to the confines of working within a contract. <laughs> um, but um, there is competition in other areas besides schools for BCBAs that, that is competition for us. I do have some hope that advertising over the summer would make a difference rather than after the school year has started and everyone's kind of in their routines. Okay. I think, Lisa, you had your hand up. Yeah, I have a quick question just about the referrals. I was very interested in your request for referrals and also more ultimate service delivery or is it just more evaluation? Um, we're, the process is a time process. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I think in the next two years, we would see the concerns being raised this year and next leading to a large increase potentially of IEPs and service needs. So we're just in the front end of that um, and figuring it out. There's also processes in special ed that we do have to rule out that they have received proper instruction uh, to make sure that it's a disability, not just a need for instruction and intervention. So um, that's that's a question that's coming forward to teams when we've had students that have had to have multiple absences or have not accessed instruction as they would have remotely versus in person. So that's a that's a question that teams are really is really wrestling with: is this an identifiable disability or is this lack of access to instruction in the typical manner that they could perform successfully with? Oh. <laughs> So I'm wondering, um, you don't have to get it to me tonight, uh, but do you have in one place, like how many uh, FPs do we have that are BCBAs or psychologists or they're in your call center? I, I'm guessing I'd have to get what's outside of your call centers from George or Steve, but it would be nice to have an overall sense of exactly what do we have in the district for you know, supportive services. Yes, we, have, we, we have these two support full psychologist now one is represented as 0.5 and he actually is uh full-time he's partially paid out of a different funding source so jim sparrow is a 1.0 tommy reynolds is a 1.0 and right now our bcba is 1.0 we're looking to add a fourth and that's throughout the whole district i'm not aware of any other call centers and then paris fall under your call centers as well paris yeah yes okay. Okay. And then, are you seeing an increase in 504 plans as well? Um, and that is sometimes the outcome of the referral process is we've identified a need for accommodations or a disability that exists perhaps medically, but they don't need specially designed instruction. So again, I think that would potentially be a, we're going to see that this year into next a potential increase there. If that's what the teams that are making referrals ultimately decide the child does not need specially designed instruction, they just need accommodations made, then the 504 plan 
could be an outcome that another team looks at and decides if a 504 plan is an appropriate need to support that student. And is that team still the guidance counselors, or is that falling under someone else's? Uh, 504 teams are made up by the people that uh, are most connected with the student's area of need. So, for example, if it's a health need, the nurse might be the one that is in charge of that. Guidance counselors many times are, and that's probably the number one go to 504 lead person. But we have nurses and sometimes we have speech providers and it's a hearing loss. So they can be made up by the members that best fit the student's need and profile to be able to address the accommodations. Generally, guidance counselors are the go to 504 people in each building. And we're having adequate staffing to that. Uh, I would say, I think throughout my presentation that we are feeling that demand and staff, including that counselors, are at a pressure point. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on the side? Harry, it might not be the right place for it, but I did have questions regarding Medicaid building. Which section would that make most sense to? So, meaning the I'm just cost of it or where it comes into revenue? Revenue. So, I'll turn to Nathan, but there's a revenue section of the budget. <laughs> That's a we have a tuition fees fund where she just mentioned the uh, 50% of that psychologist plays, and that's a Medicaid funded portion um, of, of the department. Uh, it's suffer because uh, she'll talk. I know that she, um, I have a Medicaid she, she plans to overview Medicaid and talk about some of the impacts that we've had there, but. Uh, yeah, it'll just be more specific, just and I, it might not be the place right now, but I know that other. Um, Districts that have a health center and have a provider it has a bit more of like the ability to bill is maximized, but it might not be, it might be pennies compared to what. So there, I think but. they're referring to one step of the process, which is gaining orders in yeah. order to bill. And we actually contract with a uh, nurse, the highest level Practice. nurse, <laughs> yes, the highest level nurse that can sign orders in order to maximize our funding. Okay, great. So we have a process in place. She, Try to do that, but we still have seen a significant decrease in trust. Thank you, Margo. Um, my question might not be you can punt it to the end, but um, in light of the referrals, will there be a time where we all have a good sense of shoot, these are all coming in as needing occupational therapy, and we're gonna have to shift that end, or speech needs are high? You know, is it? Will that be in time to make that proposal? I know what your proposals are for increases, but if it shifts it even more. Um, the quick response, I guess I'd say, we are obligated to provide the services that the IEP teams request, and we're legally bound to that. So even this year, as our OT needs have maximized out our staff, I've had to contract out to get the services covered. Okay. The additions I've made are based on reasonable estimate and talking with the teams of where we are now and some of the impact we may see next year related to OT uh, speech increases. If they, they skyrocket more, we would have to contract out for those services. And then again, looking to come to the next budget with a different plan, but there's a reasonable uh, level of expectation with the increases we have for them to cover into next year. Okay. And include some intervention services because we've lost that of going into kindergarten and first grade classrooms. So I said, as I asked OTs in speech, how do we get some of that back? It was we need more time across the board, across the district. And we felt like the increases would allow those access points that in a long run serve you better, you know, for early okay. intervention processes. Okay. Can I Sorry. just ask a follow up on that? Are you, um, you said you're contracting out. Are yeah. you seeing a significant staff shortage just with getting more and more contract? Like, do you see that? becoming a problem and not be able to meet those demands through contracts? So uh, in OT land, <laughs> I have a retired OT from our district that has been able to pick up some things. And at this point, it's not, it, it's an evaluation here <laughs> to take a pressure point off of a uh, team. It's a consult on a student that's not identified, but we really feel they have that need. So right now I have that avenue as well as who we typically use for our PT services. They also have OTs on staff, so we have existing relationships that have served as well in the speech arena as well. Uh, there are three or four agencies that have worked with Portsmouth in the past and will work with us to get the things covered if, if they have the staff available. It is, uh, I will say, I need to make the request sooner <laughs> and with more emphasis in order to get it covered in a timely manner uh, versus just thinking I can go get it. I really am asking teams to tell me as soon as you think there may be a student coming up or a need that I need to cover 
because it may take them four to six weeks to figure out their schedule in order to try to accommodate this. Yes. Um, yes. For, uh, for the newbies here, uh, just two things, I guess. Can you tell us um, where the current folks that are listed here uh, under the psychologist, where, like, what schools they're working with, and then also, um, you know, where is the, the stuff that you're contracting out? Is that going to be in the budget somewhere? That, 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 it's not on this page, though, right? So there are contracted service lines in each of the um, uh, building levels. So there's some at elementary level, some at middle level, okay. and some at high school level. So when you see a zero through twenty line, that's where you're finding contracted services for the first part. Of so question. they end up getting lumped in with all contracted services. It's a yes. At it's not level. specific oh, to. Yeah, go be more specific. And go like right now we're talking about cost center one thirty seven. Yeah. You, when you do look there, let me go back because this is one of those early on help, helpful items that we could have talked about. Right. Every one of these cost centers is set up. You'll see salaries listed first in the, in the entry point on the you know, first page, and and you'll see a benefit summary that follows that, and mm -hmm. then they'll move to a part of the budget that they they refer to as operating. We refer. I'm part of, I'm part of them now, right? We we refer to. Uh, Something I'll stop being new, right? Um, we refer to as operating, and operating is everything, not salaries and benefits. So that's contracted services. And if I told you, if I, I could give you, a, without giving you more information than you want, um, the account number is the account number is a small four-digit number in here in the list that that begins with a zero in every case. And this whole document really, cost center by cost center, is driven in order of, 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 of account number. And the salaries are in the 100s, so they come first. And the benefits are 200s. And what follows in operating, 300s are contracted services of different kinds, as are 400s and 500s, although they specialize. 600s are all the stuff, so supplies and then software and, uh, and foodstuffs, if there were any need for that. And then 700s are equipment down at the end of each cost center, you'll see those. And so in the case of system psychologists, where we're in cost center 137, you'll see a very small cost plenty, but it's just four names there listed at the top of that budget line. Mm -hmm. And then benefits are summarized. And then in the bottom, there are contracted services as well as a single supply line and equipment line. That's all specific to the cost center of, or the concept, if you will, of psychology and behavioral, certain behavioral services has fallen in under psychology in general. Part of why this stuff doesn't land in a building budget separately is because in state reporting, we've got, to, we've got to call it out and report it out by these particular functions. OT is separate from PT, is separate from speech, is separate from psychology, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of this format, which is maybe not intuitive or, or useful to our needs day by day, it's driven like that because we're 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 so we're so powerfully controlled by the reporting that we end up doing at the beginning and at the end of the recycle. So anyway, that was a a yeah. one on one. I should have given you a bit before. No, it's all right. I guess I just wanted to be clear though, because it looks like the psychology contracted services are in there, but you're saying we have some BCBA contracted services right now, yep. and those aren't showing up under this cost center. That those are somehow being integrated into each building operating budget. Yes, they are under, uh, you'll see additional as we go through, um, we have BCBA services, I don't do we break it up by building, and then 165, there's also BCBA services as well, which is our out-of-district tuition, because we have students that receive those services in out-of-district placements as well. And, okay. it, and eventually, I mean, you've got to, you're getting a break, eventually, I think statewide, BCBA services, that whole behavioral idea, is probably going to land in its own its own function, which is which is kind of what our cost centers are driven by, uh, to some extent, it's, it'll land in its own function. Like OT and PT have their own BCBA services, those behavioral services probably will land in their own, but they have grown up over the last 10 or 12 years in many cases, and they, they infiltrate the budget and the state has yet to bring one in and say, hey, wait, this is meaningful. We should have this on its own, in its own concepts. Okay. And the first part of your question was around the buildings they cover. Yeah. Uh, Jim is, uh, so James Sparrow yeah. is at uh, uh, the high school, covers Little Harbor and Don Darrow. Tommy Reynolds is at PMS B. Franklin and also at the high school. Uh, they both uh, share if a preschool need were to come up, if Lister needs comes up, it kind of depends on what's happening with each of their caseloads. And then we have uh, needs to evaluate at St. Pat's as well as potentially charter schools. 
uh, and those kind of shared. So concentrated, <laughs> they're both at uh, uh, the high school about half time, uh, and then Little Harvard Ontario for Jim and New Franklin and middle school is Tommy. And three, the BCBA covers the entire district right now across all buildings. So again, Nancy, I know that it's something I requested last year. I don't know if that would come to Nathan through central office or whatever. But if we could just get a listing of the services in the district, not just special ed. Jeanette's always great about putting all her stuff on the team, but just where it is in the buildings, what's outside of special ed, this counselor, social work, you know, we keep being asked about FTEs, but it would be nice to see what's contracted, what's you know, where are we spending our dollars around these services? Is that something you could do, Nathan? Or I don't know. Sure. Where I can start. Yep, I could definitely. I can pull some data, start to push it down. Then it would just be all in one place. We'll try to make. Yeah, try to make it. Yeah, intuitive. Make it make sense uh, for presentation. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, can we move on to the next item? <laughs> uh, so preschool is cost center one hundred and fifty. Um, here you'll see increases for our for educators because we want to increase our preschool hours. We were running 8 to 11.30, four days a week, and this year we decided to expand that by an hour. Um, addition, and we have opened uh, an inclusive preschool setting, meaning it's not just students with disabilities. We will now take students as peer models. Our spots filled up immediately, and we, we anticipate that there will be a uh, continued demand. Um, and so those hours across the board were increased. We did also anticipate due to that increased demand that we may need to expand into afternoon sessions. Um, right now, in the afternoons, our staff are working. They're just not running a program. They are out, for example, at Seacoast Community School providing services. Um, we have speech services that can occur throughout the district. Uh, um, and so we believe that there may be the need to increase to afternoon based on the numbers that we're seeing, the projections and the demand that we have. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had some sort of coverage extending into the afternoon um, should we need to do that to cover IEP services and make sure that class sizes aren't too large, but then also to allow more peer models to come in as we try to expand that program and offerings for early intervention. So can I, without, without slowing us down so we take all night, let me just, if you're in, in cost center 150 and you're looking at the paraprofessionals from left to right year over year, so the program has been a three hour program. And those FTEs, there's still, we still only expect five faces, five names, five people. The, the budget will speak to a, a pickup of one FTE, one full time equivalent. But in fact, I, I put hours into the new year and I should have put them in for, um, for comparison's sake in the old year, but you, you've got now. Everybody is working at least four hours each day, but two of them have bumped up to six hours. So they jumped from what would have been 43% of a position, a position being a seven hour position, a seven hour day as a standard, they jumped from 43 to 86%, which is a doubling. And when you do that, plus one of them jumping to four hours only a day, they add up 43%, 43%, 14% add up to what looks like one total, one total person. And the reality is it's just a growing of those who in the number of hours that they'll serve each day. Just to make sure that this starts with, again, for everybody, we start to make some sense. Okay. Yeah, I put those hours yeah. to help. Okay, we'll start on this side of the room this time. Are there any questions for this cost center? Just curious about the um, tuition, the tuition, the so, tuition program for the models. Yeah, we, uh, when we said it, we tried to keep it uh, pretty minimal in order to attract um, anything we've heard feedback that it's too low uh, related to community-based programs. Um, I believe it's $400 a month for the four day a week, um, four hours. Um, so yeah, we set it low, not knowing how much attention and interest we get and we get plenty. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Liz. Um, so the parents have increased, but the teachers have not increased. Um, is that because, I mean, I, I know Beth is um, special education, but so is, are we going to be seeing a teacher increase as well if we're going to extend the day and 
So right now we have both Beth and Joanne in one room and Rose with a partnership with Seacoast Community School in another room. So we have two teachers in each room. Uh, we would look to, uh, instead of going out into the community as they are doing right now in the afternoons, for example, run a uh, center-based with two of those teachers as well. Um, so it, what, what it means is a restructuring of the use of the individuals. And this would also rely on our continued partnership with Seacoast Community uh, School to have that additional staff member with our partnership with them. Can you believe my son had Rose as a teacher in preschool? <laughs> He's 32 years old and he was three when he went. <laughs> She's amazing. She's amazing. Tell Rose we'll edit that out of the <laughs> <laughs> play that. <laughs> She's amazing. Okay, are there any more questions for this class center? Okay, let's move on to 151. Uh, 151 is elementary special education. And um, when I presented in December, I certainly think I brought forward that my concerns probably most primarily lie for staffing at the elementary level, just that uh, we want to make sure we're um, identifying early needs and uh, targeting them. And that's really where uh, some pressure points have been felt this year. So the request is to add an additional elementary level uh, person to support IEP required services. Um, in this class center, we also are now reflecting ESY expenses. We have always had ESY expenses, but we charge them, for example, to the people that work during the summer. Um, and so this is a more accurate <laughs> portrayal of those services. Uh, we also have seen an increase in those expenses. We've tried to do a lot the last couple of summers for our students with special education needs to make sure that we were uh, able to recoup skills of any regression that was happening. Um, and there is uh, changes in the elementary cost for related services uh, uh, for contracted services um, based on what the current trend is. So uh, I was able to look at our expenses and then project out where we needed some increases and where we needed some decreases. Any questions? Carrie, ESY is. Yes. Oh, excuse me. I have. I always fault teachers when they use acronyms. <laughs> I have like a new teachers using acronyms when not everyone in the audience is really open. It's extended school year, okay. and it's not summer school. It's when an IEP team decides that a student needs to have their IEP services in the summertime to prevent any loss of skills. Um, and that they can continue to move forward on their IEP goals. So it's not what some people think of as summer school, it is very specific to the student's IEP. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with a question? I actually have a question. I noticed throughout the budget in all the areas that we're examining here, the audiology services, is that um, found out? I mean, is it worth it for us to hire an audiologist or not? I, mean, I just have that thought. Um, I would add them up, and I have generally been told unless it's getting to that $80,000 mark, it's not a full time employee. Uh, I would say these are running in the 30th range, generally speaking, um, and they're really, really, really hard to find. Uh, educational audiologists are very hard to find, I'll say, which specialize in school based service needs and the equipment that we utilize. Um, the addition of that service has been. Um, there's been an increased awareness of the need for that and the technology behind, uh, for example, that even a, a simple thing like a child wearing a hearing aid now might not be compatible with classroom systems or the tech that's being used. So we've had to really uh, consider all of the technology that students access uh, for something that might have been much simpler in the past <laughs> um, to just check a hearing aid and the batteries. Now it has to make sure that it's compatible with all the devices that are being used in all environments. So when we went remote, actually, that was uh, kind of an uptick in making sure that students at home accessing with hearing loss um, could access on all the different devices um, and all the different tools that are being used in an appropriate manner. So we had to purchase some equipment and uh, sometimes just beyond me, change the bandwidth and change uh, the codes that it's attached to and change equipment in some cases. <laughs> Wow. Sure. So I'm wondering the things that we're talking about contracting with an audiologist, an SLT, et cetera, et cetera. Are those individually contracted based on the IEP, or are we contracting for so many up to so many IEPs and revisiting those on an annual basis? How are those contracts handled for service? So uh, I would say both end up happening. When we have an audiology need across the district, I certainly try to find one provider so that there's consistency across the buildings. 
So for example, audiology is one that I have a contract with an educational audiologist for any of the needs of the district. The IEP teams make the determination how much service they provide. And I just need to make sure the contract covers that. If it were to go over, we have to revisit the contract. Um, but for example, when things pop up and we weren't planning for them, then it might be that I'm going to wherever I can find that service. So for example, this year, speech, there are um, three different agencies that are covering individual kids' needs that have come up unexpectedly. Um, and it was who I was able to find to provide the service in a timely manner. So those longer terms, are they revisited on an annual basis? So every, every year, the IP teams and the, I, and the services that are in those would drive the amount of service. But we always look to cover our stuff internally if we can for those kind of existing things like speech and IT. Um, but audiology and PT, we currently know we're going to be contracting out for every year. If you're asking, do we like to bid out? We do not at this point. <laughs> Liz. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a, a, a couple of things. So the um, the BCBA um, it would cost the seventy two on the, back on the psychology page, but then we're sort of looking at on um, in the in, in this cost center in elementary that there's uh, the contracted services is, is that sixty seven k number, and then that sort of goes down to twenty k with the idea that there would be somebody hired on. Yes, that would be if we are able to hire the second BCBA okay. um, with the thought that right now we're at the point that we're over a second person even taking on okay. um, all the contracted out services. Additionally, there are times when, for example, a student has come or moves into us with an existing relationship and we do try to kind of make a transition over. So we anticipate that there could be some addition, some contracted needs that would still exist. Okay, and then I just want to clarify too on the nursing services. I saw the nursing services under P sort of went away for this year. So I'm assuming there's a child that's moving up um, and that's sort of the, that's where the amount comes from. Uh, I can't speak to individual student needs, yeah. but um, that's, sometimes that happens. And it's also sometimes we have move-in students that land in the cost center that we started this year off. Now we know for next year, we need to put that service in. Okay. And my last question is, um, I, you know, I know some schools have sort of integrated or, or sort of redistrict to sort of not, I'm not saying I'm not throwing this idea out there at all, um, but I guess I just wonder, there's some districts that I've moved to having K through one in one school and, and two, you know, in another school, and I guess I wonder, you know, that it, to me that seems like that would help have the services more concentrated. Is there a way that, um, is there a way that we could do that or share services? Um, it, you know, obviously we have three schools, we're servicing three schools, it's creating a, a cost at each individual school, but um, I don't. I don't know if you could speak yeah, to that. Certainly, at all. that design would. Uh, it, first of all, it would be well beyond special ed for that consideration yeah. um, to consider it. Um, what it could do, for example, is concentrate um, speech or OT services at the younger years. Um, but overall, our numbers would still support the number of teachers yeah. that we have um, contracted that I'm proposing here. It, um, thinking of a caseload of 12 to 13 as a desirable point with the overall numbers of elementary students, we'd still kind of be in the ballpark of the same number of case managers. Um, so I'm, I'm but you're kind of doing yeah. that already with yeah. some of the psychologists and whatnot. Yes, there are certain we have even our occupational therapists and speech, some of them travel. So okay. um, we try to make it as building base as possible because that's the most efficient and cost effective for them not to lose time in travel. Uh, but we do have staff members throughout this budget that are uh, in more than one building. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is, is there any reason that it wouldn't benefit us to put bids out? Um, these contracts? I think it's I think it's important to get a sense of what the area costs are for the service. And if at any point we feel that we're at a rate that we could look out for a better, better rate, we should be doing so. Uh, for example, our uh, physical therapy rate, I think is one of the better rates I've heard in connections with just our uh, directors that I know, what do you think, for PT, kind of that, that conversation on the side. Uh, and so I haven't felt the need that we're being overcharged in any area based on kind of the rates in the, in the region. Uh, I meet on a monthly basis with the Seacoast area directors, and then we have uh, monthly statewide, and I get a sense of some of that just from that networking and as well as sometimes it's shared uh, amongst the group, what are the rates in your area? So we get a sense 
that people being overcharged in any way. Um, I think there's also probably like national figures on what those costs are, but I typically go with kind of what's in our area, what the costs are. And at this point, our contracts, uh, I'm not aware of any that I feel we're being overcharged for. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Or that there's a right out there. Okay. Anyone else before Liz goes my second time? Okay, Liz. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up about the pair of salaries, the increase that we had offered. I mean, was there any sort of uptick in that? And, you know, will we see that on the budget eventually? And would there be any idea of continuing that? I mean, obviously, we're using, um, uh, I don't know the fund, where the funds that we're using, as the funds are where that's coming from, but the um, the increase in pair of salaries. So we did an increase in substitute, okay, uh, some substitute rates, and we did get an uptick in applications to be a substitute in this okay. past week. Even we've had people coming in. But the actual salary of pairs that are existing pairs has to go through a negotiation process because it's a contract. Okay. Um, uh, certainly, I'm hearing that all areas are considering rates for all <laughs> of what's competitive and yep. what can draw more attractive. Um, Candidates and more candidates, because uh, everyone in this area and nationwide are feeling concerns for staffing. Okay. Oh, Carrie, go ahead. Sorry. Why are um, the FTEs often like 0.93, 0.86 in the section? And are those fully benefited? And so it's figured on an eight hour day. Okay. And most of our pairs are 6.5 hour day. Gotcha. And our seven hour pairs are 8.93. So okay. I actually have a cheat sheet that gets it down to five, five and a half of what the MTE is based on an eight hour day. So I'm pretty sure it's six and a half. Six and a half is a nine point three because it's compared to seven because the yes, pair yeah, is negotiated right. for a seven hour day. So and six and a half is a nine to three. Point eight six, six is a point eight six. six. Yeah. yeah. The city doesn't do it the same way. And so every year when we blend our budget in with police and fire and government, the city finance department drags me down. They're like, okay, do do this FTE thing again. <laughs> because for them it's your full time or your part time. Yeah. And for us. You know, you could be a 0.25 or 0.57 or a 0.86, but it's all compared back to uh, teachers, by the way, are an eight hour day. Yeah. So if you saw a teacher was 80%, it's a four day, basically, four school days. You know, it's so there's some there's some underlying yeah. underlying numeric yeah. assumptions under there. But all of this is based on nine months, right? It's, it's based on one FT was based on the school year. The school year. It's not so the, sorry, every contract, nine month contract, contract. Yeah. I think yeah. nine months. Sorry, <laughs> and, and every. We uh, contract a certain amount of paid and unpaid days. So paraeducators have a contract of the number of days that they have to work, which is assigned there. Which uh, the FD goes figured on a daily assignment. Thank you and for somebody, entertaining my thrilling question. Oh, <laughs> I was just... Somebody picked up on ESY yeah. the school year, and in in extended school year, there are additional days that would be paid for staff, both both faculty as well as paraprofessional support, paraeducators. Those those show up and those would be on an hourly or per diem basis depending on what the program looks like and how much they were needed. So, so, so that wouldn't add to the FTE because those are just miscellaneous hours, if you will, they get picked up. And it should be noted that I mean parents, I think, are one of the most complicated because they they have a lot of extra little pay grades depending on what else they're doing outside of the day More questions? Okay. I do have a question. The, um, teacher of deaf services is that? I, I know I saw it on a couple of these class minutes. Is that a full time position in the end? Or no, uh, it's, it's uh, very limited service. But for those students that need it, it tends to be uh, uh, a lot of time. <laughs> uh, so uh, teacher of deaf would be, for example, a student that might need to learn some sign language as part of the communication, particularly like elementary with their uh, entering the school building. Um, they might need to train our staff on uh, those items, but it is not. Um, I want to say right now we probably have seven students, um, but again, they tend to be longer hours, particularly as students, as students transitioning into the school system for some training uh, that's necessary. Very limited staff throughout the state, um, and very uh, hard to find people, <laughs> uh, and that is a contracted service. I am not aware. Any place other than maybe Manchester that has a really? staff member as a TOD, they tend to be in multiple places covering multiple, multiple districts. Interesting. Oh, it's not in your largest area for revenue loss. So maybe I'm jumping ahead. Sorry, I'm just 
don't have the revenue in front of me. <laughs> no, it's not the I'm revenue. I'm not going to ask you the revenue questions, I swear. Yeah. You have on here guidance counselors no longer able to provide services, order or review care or support. So that is under the Medicaid um, process. So guidance counselors are no longer recognized in the Medicaid school rules as an appropriate provider of a medical service. Um, they are not uh, licensed to any department other than the Department of Education. So the new Medicaid rules have basically taken out any licenses by the Department of Education and say they have to be through a board like Board of Allied Health. Um, so OT, PT, speech, et cetera, that have licenses outside of education are the only ones that are recognized. Guidance counselors are not. Guidance counselors can and sometimes have training that is the same as social work services. So they have to get licensed as a social worker some of our guidance counselors have had that background training, some have not. So, because we don't call them guidance counselors anymore, school, right? School they're, they're school counselors, right? Really so, it's so it's really about the licensure. Okay, that's, yeah, because I knew that some of our school counselors have had that license, right? But some of our school counselors, I should say, there's also some people that are in our district that have that licensure that aren't school counselors, yes. but also aren't under special ed, correct? Right, for example, uh, our SAP, um, at the high school um, has a license. Um, I think that's the one I can think of. I think like a couple of case workers or social workers. Right? No, not, so, not uh, on staff. Okay. People we use as consult. So what has this done for you then? This, this, because they used to handle a lot of that. How are we so restructuring? So guidance counselors or school counselors right. used to be able to support all processes in Medicaid, from supervision of parents to doing orders, um, and all of that is completely out of picture. So that's one of the pieces that has significantly dropped our ability to bill for those services, as well as put burdens in other places, for example, supervision of care professionals for the work that is done. To not fall to a guidance counselor anymore. There's no way involved in the process. It would have to be a guidance counselor that also has social work licensure on the side, or for example, our school psychologists or BCBAs would have to be those supervisors of the paraprofessionals related to behavioral interventions. Um, and so it's shifted burdens and also reduced our ability to uh, put in billings. Because the, the guidance counselors really used to also be that kind of intervention case manager advocate that works so closely with the teachers around what kids might need for RVPs or the kids could go to So, so right. the issue is about funding. They still have to do that. We, our obligation is to provide services and do the supports that a student needs. It's just about we can't recruit the funds to do it. So are they still sitting on the teams then? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So any um, lack of ability to recruit monies afterwards does not negate our obligation to provide the services that the teams require, which in many cases do involve our guidance, our guidance and counselors across the building. Okay, thank you. Okay, shall we move on to, uh, where are we? Middle school special education, cost center 152. So not uh, significant changes here, just wanted to know what we did, uh, try to best estimate our ESY expenditures, and then we had an increase in um, our estimates for contracted services for next year. Um, uh, one of the, the addition I'll note in the contract service as assistive tech services, uh, we're seeing again, in addition to audiology needs where the technology is coming to play and, and driving some costs up, we're having an increase, particularly as the students enter middle and high school that because of our reliance on technology, we're having get evaluations around how to best access that, whether it's rhetoric issues, communication issues, and sometimes um, we're getting requests for assistive tech evaluations and then consultation um, moving forward. So we're really seeing, I put it in at middle school because that's where I've seen the largest impact, and it really is as there's more reliance on the technology and wanting students to get familiar and comfortable using that as a tool as they move into high school, we've seen the largest impact there. Um, we certainly have some assistive techniques at the elementary and the high school level, uh, but this was the place that I felt we captured the best and is most accurate based on the last couple of years. Any questions about the middle school special ed? Okay, so we move on to cross center 153, high school. Uh, here, the kind of note is yes, my expenses. Um, so not significant changes. 
see this transfer that we make to support that program, but it's funded by tuitions otherwise. Now, a number of those kids right now, a majority of those kids are uh, Portsmouth students. So there's always been a, a, a feeder, if you will, there's been a transfer that we make to help fund that, but otherwise it's, it stands as a self-funded program. Um, Jeanette, do we have a transition coordinator at the high school for the we do not. Um, so we, we do have out of district, and she works in the trans area of transition as well. Uh, that we do through my grant, so she's not covered in this, and she's part time on an hourly basis. Now, her she mostly covers out of district placements, but we generally each year have two to three students that have um, maximized their time at the high school and are still under the age of twenty one that are doing community based activities and. She generally is the one running those IEPs, but the school teams are stay involved as well because they know the students so well. So we do not have a transition coordinator. Her title is our district coordinator um, and part-time paid through grants. Okay. That brings up a question I, I think I ask every year about <clears throat> grants and why, you know, why don't we have these in the cost centers as far as expense but a revenue side that says grants or some other type of revenue so we can see like the bigger picture so we can I mean, we can we can do that part of, a lot of it, a lot of it is still like, i walked in new we had COVID, and so just we haven't really dared to make much in the way of changes to the to the process but i um uh, we don't we don't generally keep our own revenue, which is part of it, right? Those right. are they're city revenue. So for the new VA walking, it's like, well, okay, so I don't have to worry about the expenditures, not like other places where I've been. Although we do we do have um listed that's self-funded. We have the federal grants that we, we talk about a lot. It's not just IDEA for special ed, but there's type one, two, three, four, there's others. Um, and so we could definitely come up with a uh, 207 is the tuition and fees, and that's always hung out on the bottom of our monthly financial, uh, but it's it has a weird cycle to how it's how it's funded and when it's funded. So so that that reporting doesn't always offer up much intuitive information that you could you know you could use to gauge how it's performing. So yeah I mean the reason I asked that is some of these like title one, you know, they're pretty reliable. But yeah. other ones come and go and it'd be nice to know oh you know we've been using this resource and now you have to fund it, right? Well and so the Medicaid yeah. Medicaid schools, right. they changed the rules so much three or four times in that last cycle. Right. And it really, I mean, it took the revenue that was running five, six, she's going to say, you know, we're down to a fourth of it, but it's running 600 plus thousand and now not even hitting 200,000 a year or more. So yeah. that definitely, definitely has an impact. So yeah, let's let's continue with score. I'll try to put some stuff together to see if it, if it scratches that, you know, the kind of information that is meaningful and then we could look at routinely. Um, if we can have a call center for it, if we could just have a graph report to understand what dollars are being yeah. poured in and how yeah. long they're, I mean, like the outdoor graph that's covering transportation for the outdoor program. Like, when is that going to run out? When do we need to start thinking about either restructuring yeah. that program so that we don't have to have transportation calls and we can use on site outdoor resources or, um, you know, up, renew the grant or um, build it in for? 
coming coming down the fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me just say this. If you haven't already picked it up, the first two digits is fund. That's fund 11. 11 is our general fund. And that's generally what this conversation is about because that's the tax generated. It's a tax funded, property tax funded portion of our budget that we give to the city and they bundle in with police and fire and general government. The next five digits are the cost center. And generally, as long as you're in general fund and we're looking at this book, the first two digits will be zero. It's just three digits we work with. So tonight we're talking about 150, 151, 152, 153. The next four digits are the function code. And the function code is what drives my life in terms of reporting and dealing with the state in compliance reporting, as well as you know end of year annual reporting. And everything 1200 is special ed. Everything that when you get in and look at the building budgets, the building, the principles, and the most of that's 1100, which is regular ed. But you'll also see within some of the special ed, there are 2100, 2190, 2160. That's where some of these specials are, the OTs and PTs and so on and so forth. And, and the, mark of, the mark of a detailed chart of accounts is how many of those 2100s are broken out. And we've already talked about the teacher of the deaf, the audiology, talked about BCBA, which really ought to live in their own eventually. But for right now, most of them live in either 2190. 90 or in 1200s. I was really trying to chase up to that next two digit, which is a 30 in this case here, because we're in 153, which is high school. Everything in the city in the tens is elementary. So 10 one zero is general elementary. 12 is your Don Darrow, 14 is your little harbor, 15 is your is your New Franklin, 20 is middle school, and 30 is high school. If you get beyond 30. Most of that is district-wide stuff. So 40s and 90s that show up in the budget. When you get to one of those counts, you go, I wonder what this is for. Oh, it's a 90. They're spending this district-wide. And Nathan's got to figure out after the fact so he can do his state reporting because he's got to break it up by each building later. And so part of why this is just getting thicker and thicker, this document is year over year, is because we keep adding more detail to break out to the building specific so that we can stand up to equity statements that the state is asking us to and the federal government is asking us to produce and so that we can satisfy our state reporting. The last few digits, I won't even bore you with it, but then there's a gap and there's four more digits and that's that account I was talking about where the 0100 series is all the salaries and the 0200s benefits and the 300s and beyond are the operating stuff down below. Again, that's tedious and it's elementary, but if you haven't ever heard it, <laughs> It might make this a little more. Let me just put a key on the front. And someday, someday we'll just give you the, the definition yeah. of the top program. What's yeah. your level of satisfaction on the account number? My level? Yeah. Of the, the so, account number, the accounting system that I got all, you know, we could, you know, we need a lot more money if, we, if I'm going to make things that I'd like them. So, so that numbering system, for example, my IDEA grant doesn't start with 11. Start with 22, 22 yeah. the grant, so it's a whole different, it's not anywhere here. Reporting out on all those 22s would be something we can go off of. Oh, Perry. So, um, one is just a comment, and I don't, my knowledge is outdated, but I'm a, I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm also a budget geek and raised by an accountant. But um, one of the things I know schools in Massachusetts have done a long time ago is establish a school health center. And um, then a lot of the, the health services that were billable were provided under that. And so they were billing at 100% as opposed to the 50%. I don't know if so it's meant to be a medically based, not a school based service. It's an integrated medical, uh, medical service integrated within the school system. 
So that was sort of my question before. But. So uh, my point to that would be I'm not familiar with Massachusetts right. Medicaid School. I know it's completely different than New Hampshire Medicaid mm -hmm. School. If you change that term, and I am aware that the NES students that attend out of district placements in Massachusetts, that those schools will not do our New Hampshire Medicaid School building because their rules are so different. So I don't know if the Massachusetts comparison can be made or not. I honestly just don't know the answer to that. But New Hampshire Medicaid schools, and I have worked in Maine and Kansas, where each state is so completely different that um, I don't know that they would allow us to try to make a medical facility and build differently because they're taking the rules rather than. And then, sorry, I have one. No, go ahead. We're gonna, um, and then one conversation that Nathan and I have had, or a few of us have had, was just around um, like I have grants at UNH, we have um, encumbered costs, we have like all of these kind of supervision methods. And I was surprised that that wasn't the case. Um, like the ID grant? What? Yeah. So the process that we go through is the DOE is supervising that and approving all the activities that we have to submit. Um, and honestly, it's been pretty much the same because we have the same gotcha. amount of money. So managing um, those grant budgets is not a challenge with the reporting systems that you currently have? I, I would say I have not found it at first some part of my okay. position. Um, it certainly takes some time. <laughs> it takes some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one point we had about six of them going at the same time that has just kind of settled down. So they extended some dates. So right now I have three, uh, and it's much more manageable than the time when there were six across five or six years that you're trying to figure out how to pay down. Um, so, so um, I, and I put that out there because of the conversation that we had that, that I think investing money in a district to modernize reporting systems in whatever way that is, I'm yeah. not, no expert on what that is, is a cost savings overall. And so that I just wanted to kind of throw it out there to you. So, so one of the things that I, I, I fault the city not at all, I, I, had, I got a great working relationship with city finance and I appreciate how hard those folks work, but our software is tied to the city and it's a city solution. It's not a school solution. And there are things that, that we give up or that we miss uh, that I've experienced in other schools where you were buying just for a school. But in our case, you kind of deal with property and assessment and tax and you know, there's all water and sewer billing. So the city's got to have an all-encompassing solution that, that really works mm. pervasively. And I, and I respect that, although, I, and I think they're open to talking about how we can make sure we've got better tools, but don't talk to Courtney Richings from the CTE when she comes in, mention the grants and Courtney's, Courtney does, uh, they're, they're not huge grants that she gets, but she's really great at chasing, you know, chasing funding realities. And then what she's run into that we've struggled with in the accounting software is she might have multiple multiple supply lines with different purposes but the way it gets aggregated and collected or carried if you will in the accounting software it all looks like one account so then when we're billing out against uncle sam looking for reimbursement if we don't get the right if we're not keeping track of it going in effectively we could use some greater levels of detail we could use some you know some, some easier processing uh, processing and it, it doesn't seem to be there. But again, part of it is we got to get fully staff and you know time and outside of COVID will help. But I appreciate where you, I appreciate where your suggestions are headed because yeah, some mean, of these things could be a whole lot easier than well, a lot of man hours that go into trying to chase the people. I think to so like Hope and Ryan's point of, of like wanting certain things like in a certain system, that would not be work on you. That right. would be uh generate so and fun. so. I think just acknowledging that that's the system, that's the way it is, and this is why is good. And and also that if um, we're requesting, you know, if we're requesting things, acknowledging the workload that that takes, even you know, quantifying it to say like, is this a, a forty hour valuable report, or you know, this report's a thirty minute, whatever. You know, I th I think that's just important so that we have like a marker of how much time everything is taking. Well, and fairly, I think I made the comment. I love it when people tell me what the hypothesis is so I can go chase data that I think is really applicable uh -huh, yeah. rather than people asking me for a whole lot of data. And then I work to try to dig it all up so they can go through to see if there's any noise there. And it, sometimes that could be a lot of work to grab data that they go, well, no, I didn't find anything meaningful. And, wow, that was, that was big. So yeah. as often as there's a hypothesis, certainly, like I've already heard that a couple of times, we can chase. We can chase some meaning, some meaning in this, and, and definitely pull out some stuff. But that's it's, it's not as easy as it should be in some cases. To Carrie's point, 
I think she raises a good point that there does need to be a conversation had with the city. I'm not sure if they understand the behind the times software that we have to be connected to. I mean, we've had so many conversations in the communication committee <laughs> around the limitations of how we can put out communications and, and just access points, tracking points and stuff, because we have to be reliant of being tied to the city. So I think it's not just in finance that there could be some upgrades to help the access to the school district. I think that's kind of a conversation that could be had across many many departments. And that's more and that's brought a broader conversation. I think if I didn't finish saying it, the city on the finance side has been putting dollars away in the CIP in in in, in pursuit of getting a certain dollar value that they can go out and, and make purchases and implement something. Okay. Like um, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll retire first. That could be, you know, if you've lived it, you know that those are those can be big. Too, so. but I have a question about this health center, um, but I did want to carry this point about student um, health centers. I know that Summersworth just sent out an email that they're actually going to be offering one. So I don't know if that's sort of what you were getting at, but it'd be interesting to see how that plays out and, and what that might mean for us in New Hampshire and um, uh, the benefit there. Um, and I, I think two different conversations. One is, is that help me in Medicaid land? Not so sure, but is it uh, uh, benefit public students that have a public health center? That's a whole different conversation. Related to Medicaid billing, I just would have to do a lot more investigating to see if there's any increase in the ability to bill. Um, but student health centers, a, a conversation is that what the community needs and what the students need. Um, different conversation than for purposes of Medicaid billing. Could we gain revenue in any way? Makes sense. And so the question I had about this cost center was that there's only one era at the high school. Um, so not, this is a case where it's, it's covered elsewhere. <laughs> so okay. in that uh, two, so the tuition and fees, yeah. tuition and fees fund had as its genesis largely that it was a, a place where they put all of the special ed costs related to services that might be built to SA 50 against the tuition contract. So a lot of them are still there, and we take a portion of the SE 50 tuition to fall against those fall against those costs. That's also where Medicaid billing went because they ultimately put Medicaid Medicaid uh, Medicaid reimbursable services there because then it would wash away, um, as opposed to having those things fluctuating in in a way that would impact the city's budget and the city's revenue stream. So they stuck them in this tuition and fees um, fund, which is in fund 27, and we call it 207. It's cost center 207, <laughs> all of her high school. I, we don't, and I to this day don't know why, there's just one para that's still stuck in this cost center because the rest of them are all in 207. <laughs> Okay, so so in some area there's some sort of um, covering. Like I guess it would be helpful to sort of know what's kind of shifted. Like another thing I noticed was, you know, there's no BCBA contracted services for the high school. Is that are those just not being offered at the high school, or is that just? No, we would anticipate if we get our second position that that level would be able to be covered by the second position that was added. Okay. The only place that we would anticipate possibly contracting out for would be at the lower level. Okay, so some of the tuition that we're receiving from the high school is taking away some things from this, which includes the paras. And is there anything else that sort of was thrown into that, or will we see that on a separate um, separate document here? Well, that's a separate. So I don't know. I think off the top, paras. There's some to, to, to there's, teach there's teaching staff. Teaching staff in that in that that okay. Any other questions on the high school portion? Okay, let's move on to speech. Uh, speech, speech 156. Speech 156, um, again, anticipating, well, currently experiencing higher than we can support speech needs, uh, and also uh, not being able to do the early intervention at K-1, in addition to some projection of some needs for next year, we would like to add a full-time speech position. Uh, and here we put it in under Dundero and New Franklin, that's where we're seeing the uh, greatest uh, needs expanding beyond our full-time people in those buildings. We would look at that at the beginning of next year, make sure that's where the need is, as we do at the start of any year, year because at this point in time, we, we should project out, but we could have moves and shifts, um, so we make our best estimate of where that need would land, but we would look across the district and determine where the position would best be utilized, uh, but likely split between buildings would would be the um, UFTP would be not located in any one building. 
Any questions from anybody on Twitch? I have a quick question. When yes. somebody split, did they have an office somewhere? Like, it's, or do they, they just like sort of carrying their stuff with them back and forth or having some stuff in the special ed office at the school? Like, how does that work? Um, I, I can say now that uh, every one of our uh, buildings does have a location for a speech office. Okay. Um, it, it ends up being two people and actually becomes more of an issue and that you might have one speech office and then you have to find times to, for example, see two kids with different articulation needs in places where you can hear those sound errors. So some, uh, likely it would be shared office space, but service location might be created in some of our buildings that are more pressed for space, meaning they have to find an empty classroom at the time that the kid needs the service in order to provide that service. Uh, they generally might transport limited materials between buildings and they certainly share things like testing kits across the district, um, but generally they're not running around with a rolling cart. Like I have experienced in some of my previous jobs where their car is their office and they're transporting. We currently do not have that with our uh, staff that travels. Okay. We certainly take items, but not their entire uh, working and functioning. Yes, oh, Jeanette, um, the early literacy that you have covered here, is, is any of that, can any of that be covered by any of our reading specialists in the buildings? So if they're not having like articulation problems or word retrieval problems or otherwise that might be covered specifically with the speech language. Yeah. So um, I would say our teams really work to differentiate when it is um, necessary that a um, speech language provider needs to intervene around a language need versus a reading development need where many of our case managers and special educators and many of our regular education teachers are quite first in developing reading skills. So those things really parse that out to make sure that the uh, interventionists of this level are utilized when it is a language issue. And part of that is through the evaluation process, potentially, if they really can't tease it out. Um, but we certainly have uh, early reading needs that can be addressed by classroom teachers, general educators, and certainly interventionists, reading specialists, as well as special educators. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to OT, number 157. And OT, uh, very similar situation to speech. Um, uh, generally, occupational therapist uh, is less frequent on IEPs, however. So our ask here is for, uh, we currently have two full-time and one part-time. And our ask would be that we move to three full-time staff across the district to support all needs. And that would be in keeping with the demand that we're seeing this this year, as well as anticipation of potential increases next year. Um, so we'll make a three full-time people would meet their request. Is that because it's, you know, it's cheaper than contracting that position out at this point because of the demand? Um, yes, and more stability. And again, would allow uh, a little bit more of that building base where kindergarten teacher has a question as a person more readily available to ask than having to say we need to contract out for that extra time and trying to find that. Um, it, it's still our staff will be across buildings in this model as well, but a little more time in buildings to allow for that. So just a follow-up question. I mean, I think speech and language we see is, is in high demand, certainly OT as well, but even just because my kids had some of these issues. Um, even more. So I guess I'm just wondering when those numbers decline, um, you know, how do we use these positions that are now going to be on our payroll that may not have the high demand to need three, for instance, um, in time? How are you showing on the trajectory at which they, at any point in time, are going to be declining in the near future? <laughs> so um, um, I don't know at what point that would come into play. Uh, if anything, I think then we'd be utilizing the staff or more early intervention that is extremely limited right now that they're this year have not been able to go into kindergarten or first grade classrooms. It's really been IEP services only that they're delivering. Um, so if, if your question is like at what point in the future is the demand going to decrease, I don't have an answer to that. And I don't I don't anticipate it being the next three to five years. I guess I just would want to look at yeah. that as we also look at our intervention, which well. I totally agree with yeah. you 100%. But as we're looking at enrollment, if that's a decline for the three to five time period mm -hmm. as well, or just, just thinking about some of these more specialized positions that once they're on our payroll and can't be contracted out, then that is easy to move around in the district um, because they're so niched. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? 
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Oh, I just want to follow up to that. I guess I guess what I'm hearing from you is that um, you're saying that all the OTs are sort of strapped to IEPs right now, and right. if they weren't strapped to IEPs, we could offer early interventions in somebody's elementary school. I think they could be a resource beyond right now. It's strictly special education services okay. versus uh, more building-based resources. Um, Things like sensory needs certainly could be applied to classrooms at all grade levels and ideas and trainings for staff. And right now they have not had the ability to uh, be utilized in that manner. Uh, they are strictly IEP services. Okay, but that would have to be built into their contract up front, right? The lang that language of what their job response yeah. to. Um, yeah. no. We can utilize them however. Yeah. And, and, and in other times they have been embedded at times in our kindergarten and first grade classrooms yeah. working on PLC teams. It's just now it's contracted so that contracted in this way. Okay. Um, so that really all they have time to do is IP service. So. Okay. okay, let's move on to adaptive services number 160. Uh, adaptive ADS services. Seven. Sorry, is that uh, ESL is not under my preview okay. anymore, so I, 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 I used to cover it. <laughs> um, um, 160, the adaptive services is really um, a combination of final fours. Uh, the biggest increase that I asked for here was certainly seeing a need uh, after the last couple of years for interpreter services um, uh, for student needs, but um, more so for uh, families that are coming back when we're having meetings, we uh, pay to have interpreters present so that they can fully uh, engage, as well as documents that sometimes we need to have translated. So I asked for that to increase slightly based on um, uh, what I'm aware of, what, what I'm finding is more, sometimes we handle those buildings as well. So this is not coming from the district level, but I've certainly seen an increase in that area. Any questions? I have what my yes, is yes. a dumb new person question, but is adaptive PE under adaptive services or PE or where is uh, uh, adaptive PE? I believe she is under <laughs> the physical education. She is a PE teacher. So that's an IE so, service, but it's part of the cost center for Jeff. I think that's right. Sorry. <laughs> it's a great question because uh, <laughs> that's where it's always been. Yeah, that's okay. it's and, I mean, and, I and I haven't moved it because there's a whole section here for adapt to be and there's a salary section, but she's not in it. So somewhere yeah. along the line, there's something, there's something that drove them to move her because she's back now. She's in 112. She's fantastic, by the way. Yes. Yeah. She's been here a long time. So she's. I don't know if she knows that she's been funded in different cost centers, but <laughs> okay, the infrastructure is there. We can move her back to be like, okay. have a go. Right. You taught my son how to ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to clarify. So the um, the interpreter uh, ESL is in a separate cost center, but the interpreter service in the document translation is that just for special ed documents, or is that for all documents that would relate to uh, ESL essentially as well? Um, both. both. I mean, that, that's this is where it lands. Yeah. Um, mainly what I've been involved with is translating things like special education documents or final four plans that need to have a translation or an interpreter present at the meeting. It's the most common thing. Uh, we utilize this section even recently for parent teacher conferences where a parent has made a request that they need an interpreter to come. Uh, and so it kind of hits anytime we want to have a place that we can pay for the interpreters uh, for any. Any scenario that comes up that we need interpretation. So, um, so in classroom language translations doesn't fall under you anymore. That's under ESL. Is that correct? I mean, you need someone in the classroom translate. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, in, and are we providing that? If that I mean, I, I'm just thinking about Helene Lepel's, you know, wonderful uh, presentation she did. It's great that she can come down to an elementary school classroom, but there's other classrooms, obviously, across the district that have kids that don't speak. So, how, how, where is, where is that in the call center and who handles that? Now? It's under ESL. Okay. Eight. Eight. So said they're not necessarily translators, right. but uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, pedagogy around what good ESOL is, and I won't get into that. But they they work with the students to integrate them in the classroom to help them acquire the language and the customs and routines and everything. So like, we have like each elementary and um, and middle and high. So, 
So are we meeting the child where they are when they first come to the district? So if they're speaking only, say, Spanish, or do we, are we meeting them to, with someone that speaks their language at all, or are we just expecting to put in an English-speaking person to help integrate them and only bring them to the point of learning English? Because it seems like that would create a lot of frustration in the classroom, which seems like a quick call with their adaptive services. So, so my train previously was the ESO teachers work with the families to make a plan for that child um, on how to best integrate them and the team of people working at each school around each individual student. Uh, many times when we are a newcomer is, is that the term that utilizes in ESL, um, they will end up having to get some extra supports in some manner. But generally, I would say there's not a side-by-side one-to-one interpreter throughout their school day. It's a pair that's working with them or some other support. And sometimes it's, we're trying to figure this out. Kid arrives, family arrives, we're having meetings to try to figure out what's the best plan to make sure that the student's getting into the classroom and being able to access things. And it's different for each student. It's also different depending on their age level and their developmental level because a high school student is going to be treated differently as far as their developmental level and their social interactions than a kindergarten student. And even language research, and this is again well beyond me. Our ESL teachers are excellent and they come up with the plans and they really work with the families and the school based teams to make sure that the student is feeling comfortable and being successful as soon as possible. Uh, we sometimes have kind of surprises where it takes us a little while to get that system in place for the student that makes them successful. We've had a couple this year um, that we don't get a lot of notice before they're here and we're trying to support them. Uh, and sometimes it has meant sudden increase of staff. <laughs> For a short period of time, or some kind of phone grant transition. Um, again, this isn't under me anymore, but I'll still get phone calls to try to work with those families and then kind of hand them off to the, to the schools as I gather information. I've had two this year that have reached out directly to me just because my name was student support. And then I get in touch with the ESL teacher and sometimes it's a meeting uh, with an interpreter to say what's going on here, uh, what's the plan for the future, and working on an individual basis with a lot of factors involved. So if it's the ESL yeah. teacher, but the parents are being like paired with them, why did it get separated outside of your call center? Why would it still fall under you if your team is also coming to the table to generally specialize not at the table? It's not a special education situation. But the parents are still under your, so, your uh, call center. Are, and they're the ones being paired with the student, right? So we have how many parents in the district? 90 ish, and about 85 of them are under me. We have library pairs and ESL pairs that I do not supervise. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. And it may not be uh, you know, necessarily a power support. Yeah, a lot of times, interpreter services are used at the, the outset with registration and things like that for yeah. parents. And we, we have such a diversity of languages that come to us, Correct. it's not pra practical to have a, a polyglot in each, in, each, in each building. So. Um, we tend to contrast that that part out, unless it's something that we're Yeah, we, we certainly have some other staff that use three other languages, but certainly not the third plus that right. we're going right. across in the last few years. I remember a few years ago they said that Ian was a member of this. We had 22 different languages in our school system. That's generally in the Chinese yeah. and. Yeah. Uh, um, so yes, yeah, so really weird dialects that are, come from different countries. So um, it's, an it's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Some of them start in the care without notice. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, okay. There are interpreter services and agencies that sometimes uh, have to really search to find us an interpreter of the languages that have come to us. So sometimes, sometimes even setting up a meeting can take a week or two for the interpreter services we use that reach out nationwide. To find that kind of language and translation in an appropriate manner. So um, there's some process. There's some logistics involved in making sure that there's a appropriate plan and action in place. Um, you don't, I mean, do they still have like those? So the courts have call lists that you call a number and it gives you somebody that does like a translation for you. Obviously, this is more in depth, but is there any sort of setup like that for schools? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't, uh, when I have arranged it, it's contact with an agency that we use, yeah. um, and it takes them sometimes a little while to get things. Usually they need at least 72 hours, and if it's a more hard to find language, then it may be uh, longer than that. Okay. Uh, they also cover things like uh, American Sign Language, so there's all those kinds of languages spoken as well as uh, American Sign Language. <laughs>
Okay, let's move on to Audit District 165. Um, I just made a general statement here that uh, increase in tuition transportation service costs. Uh, I did do a separate sheet that discusses more about out of district uh, processes. Uh, this is always a very large cost center. Um, and so there's a completely separate sheet called out of district overview that just gives some background of those processes related to a determination that a student may need out of district costs. Um, I'll also put a note that we support our JLA, which is already mentioned here today. Um, and we try to make sure, given that these are individual students, that we don't put too much identifying information. So it's listed as like placements one, two, three. Um, in the tuition lines, if you see the number 402 next to it, that is if a student has court placement and then there are some funds uh, once they reach a certain cost point, the state uh, would take over the cost for uh, any educational expenses at that point. So in the notes that I call other notes, when you get to the cost center, 165, I did update the current rate. So a court order placement, which is when I say 402, that's a chapter uh, 402 reference in New Hampshire rules. Anything that's above three times the state average, which is now 50,700 plus change, is paid by the DOE. And then for high cost um, expenses, and that's out of district or in district students that um, we are servicing at a high level, um, anything at 3.5 times the average. We're eligible for 80% reimbursement from the Department of Education. That is an after the fact. So whatever we pay this year, we have to submit tons of information. Uh, and then it would be paid the next school year. Anything about the 10 times, which uh, this year is 179.8, um, could be eligible for 100% reimbursement. And that's if the state has those funds. Um, the last couple of years, we've gotten, <laughs> we've gotten the 80% and 100% um, of the allowable costs. Uh, but in years past, it has been as well as 60% of that 80% or 60% of the 100%. Um, the last couple of years, they have been able to pay after 80 and 100% rates. Right? So in other words, this one that's listed as 450,000, we would get what would percent of that? Right? We, we would, it's anything above the 62, we're eligible for 80%. Oh, okay. And once you hit the 179, you're eligible for 100% over that. So, so it's two pieces of it. 250,000, you would get back? Yes. Okay. If, if, if on the review, everything, including the wording of the dates and the, I mean, but they, they're in the business of exactly. disallowing, is the phrase. I, I, go by, I go by her office and her admin, Christine, is in her grumbling, but disallow, disallow, disallow. So they struggle. But, and the, the biggest frustration about this is only the court order 402 that she just described cuts off. And, and right. the state says, that's it, you've paid to that point, send me the bill, and the state pays the bill from there. But for all of the rest, we have to pay in full in the first period, you know, this year. And the reimbursement comes after after they beat us up. The reimbursement comes in the subsequent period, the next year. And and unfortunately, it doesn't come it doesn't come in a timeliness so that you could really manage your expectations about it because we won't find out until we're, we're into the next year what the number is. So they do tell us they do tell us the tax rates at a time. They confirm generally what they expect that number is going to be. That's something the Department of Revenue has pressured the Department of Ed to deliver on because sometimes those numbers can impact what the tax impact would be. What is that 450,000? Is that, I mean, I know you can't get specific. Yeah, that, what kind of a placement is that? So, generally speaking, costs um, over 200,000 would likely be a residential place. Okay. okay. Uh, across the board, generically speaking, full time 24 7. Correct. Any other questions, Liz? Um, just, I have a couple of questions. So um, for that 450,000, um, that's hitting us, but I mean, are we gonna get reimbursement for Medicaid if it's a residential placement or, or family if it's residential? We have two sources of potential reimbursement, both okay. Medicaid potentially, and again, that has to, on the Medicaid overview, all those pieces be met for the services that are provided um, for any of these uh, students, and then, and then potentially get the special education aid 
costs. So there are two potential sources for any of these students that meet above these costs of Medicaid reimbursement or special education aid reimbursement, depending okay. on the profile of individual students and the IEPs involved. So we're going to see a hit here, but somewhere later there's going to be, it's going to come back to us in, to, in a Medicaid section. Is that is that how that would look? So, so Medicaid can happen uh, within the same year. Special ed aid will always be the following school year. Okay. And then so for like Beckett and Stetson, um, those amounts that are on there, um, are those the full tuition amounts or is that with some sort of reimbursement, um, you know, more of like a day program, I guess? So the costs that are here, the only ones that we kept are the 402 saying yeah. that that's as much as we have to pay. The others are our anticipated costs. Okay. So without revenue included, without reimbursement for either Medicaid, that would be reflected in a different section. This would be the cost. Okay, so those are our those are our anticipated costs for those okay. reasons. Other than where it makes 402, then we did cap it knowing that we generally are able to uh, provide the documentation necessary to get to stop having costs come to us and it goes to the state at that point directly. Okay, but the amount that we see right here factors in whatever already went to things that the yeah. state has as a rule, right? Is that we have to grossly appropriate. So okay. you can't spend revenue. The state, the city gets it, right? So we have to budget for appropriation for the fullness of what the checks are we might have to cut. So only the 402 caps what we might spend. The others, the others may fall under a category where we, we are able to see reimbursement in the subsequent year, but we have to budget to spend the fullness. Okay, I just want to clarify though, the amount that we're seeing for like somewhere like Stetson or Beckett with the 402 next to it, the amount is is the cap or we haven't seen the cap yet? I mean, that there, I guess I just want to clarify that Everybody, this is the amount we're going to actually pay or we still are, have an opportunity for reimbursement on those. We put in 56,000 yeah. as a number for 402, yeah. knowing that, that, for example, if an IP isn't signed by a parent, we can't, we have to wait until it gets signed by the parent. So we might have costs slightly above the 50,000. Okay. So we thought that was an appropriate number of the cost. We might anticipate uh, the state, for example, if, if things aren't in order, then we have to submit everything in order before they start paying after that 50,000. Okay. And those that are coded as 402, we don't expect any reimbursement on those. Okay, because that's our port. That's basically we our pay the invoices up to the point that we meet that fifty thousand with the appropriate paperwork behind it, and then we don't see the invoices after that. They go directly to the state. We wish they were all like that. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but only the four hundred twos get capped, and then we send the bills to the state. The rest we have to pay, and we can submit for reimbursement later. Okay, so that fifty six or fifty two, or sorry, the fifty six amount is the amount that we may be on the hook for that we would submit for reimbursement. No, nope, that's uh, no reimbursement with 402. There's no, no re reimbursement. No one reimbursement one. So if you look at the one that's 56 under 420, maybe like specifically that one. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to clarify that. So when we have a cap at a, at a, at a 402, um, and I mean the 420 I think is supposed to be 402, so there's a little type over there. But when we have a cap at 402, we are definitely on the hook for that amount, but we could submit that for reimbursement for at some point. No. no? Okay, so that's the amount that we're actually paying. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, so to clarify, we're spending these funds without knowing whether or not we're going to receive reimbursement for, or without knowing what quantity of them we're about to receive reimbursement for? Generally speaking, it's we're federally mandated, federally right. mandated to provide those services to bring those IMP regardless of the cost. Right. The state has programs funded through federal and, and state dollars. The state has programs that may reimburse us for some of them, but there's a there's an application process where we have to compile all of our evidence and documentation and submit to the state for their review and consideration of what they will reimburse. So is there like a simple criteria for that? I mean, I don't want you to like, no. <laughs> Not that I've been able to do this. All right. Because kind of I never seem to get as much as I hope that we're going to get. Okay. So, so related to that question, the sheet that I provided called Medicaid to Schools Overview tells you the process for Medicaid reimbursement. Oh, and okay. there are eight steps to even potentially get reimbursement. 
that all have to be in complete order for you to receive the money. And then if you have an audit, they can come and take the money away if they found out that you missed any of those steps for the reimbursement that you received. So that's just one piece. There's, we're talking about Medicaid as a potential reimbursement, and then there's special education aid, which is actually a worse of a process <laughs> uh, as far as the amount of documentation. You have to have every piece of paper in order. Invoices have to match the wording in the IEP from the billers. Sometimes we don't even have control over things like that. Like if a company bills us and uses the wrong wording and it doesn't match our IEP, we have to request, can you please change the bill so we can submit it for reimbursement? And so it's a lot of paperwork uh, involved in the process. <laughs> Kim, did you have a question? Um, I, yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, the overall summary, I don't know if they always make you go first in these budget hearings, but thank you for all your time and patience. Um, I, would recommend, I, would, I, would recommend, I would recommend you always go first, but, um, but I can understand if you are unavailable next time. Um, so in summary, everything here is need-based, like there's nothing, there's no, this is pretty much to maintain status quo and move forward and provide this, the basic services we need to. Is that correct? Like so 165 is related to our- um, I meant overall, all of your centers, really. Yes, this is to legally proceed with providing IEP services and the projections that I anticipate and be the most cost effective in doing so rather than have to pay unexpectedly for things like contract and services. <laughs> so things when I, uh, we make the request for an additional speech provider, it's actually meant to be more cost effective than looking next year to unexpectedly have to find contracted services at a higher rate. And so it's anticipating needs and also the most cost effective way to cover those IEP services. <laughs> Oh, um, I'm just curious, the RJ, the RJLA support that's like 352871, so they have their separate budget, but this falls, this, these dollars fall under you, so the budget. It falls under special ed costs, yeah. because, because the cost of that, it's a special ed program, and so the costs there need to be allocated out of a special ed line, and so we put it we put it here, but it's a transfer over into the budget that Nancy speaks to, which you've done before you're talking about Lister and the people in the programs. And there are there are three 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 big pieces of the funding stream out of district private tuitions, our support, and then a piece of the tuition dollars that come from um SE50, you know, a piece of that goes there because those are all it's a high school program. So we charge we 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 assign it a piece of the high school. Program. Um, so when Nancy shows her budget, she'll have this will be built into that from being pulled from here. That it's part of her revenue stream. So it's, okay. yeah. Okay. And then last question, I'm not even sure for privacy if you can answer. So can you tell just how many 18 to 21 students we're currently supporting? Oh, I, I didn't look at that prior. We generally have three or four that are 18 to 21 since I've been here consistently. Um, so so the transition programs, five students? Um, so you are probably looking at, let me find it. And back of the, that would include not only 18 to 21 year olds, but we can have transition services occurring earlier. Okay. So if the IEP team decides this is a student that may need five years of community-based experiences, it could start, actually any transition services can start at age 14 based on the individual students. It's a section of the IEP that starts getting looked at at age 14 and has to be in place by age 16 for all IEP students. For some students, it does require more community-based services. So that those costs um, would include our 18 to 21 year olds that aren't attending our traditional high school or community-based services for anyone middle school or high school that the team decides it's necessary. Brian. Just had a uh, general question. It looked like all everything ended up in the proposed budget that was on for less, right? Yeah. Okay. With the exception of one case manager. Oh yes, except that's right. She had talked about two case managers. Okay, so that but that still wasn't part of this, right? We only asked for okay. So yeah, we spoke to that's what I was asking. Is there a wish what what draw off the wish list? Uh the so one additional case manager, and that was with some discussion of okay. uh for next year, is this an appropriate move that would cover our IP services? And we thought we could. Um okay. uh again, we have to look at that each year. 
see a risk increasing. Uh, that's certainly a concern in the back of everyone's head given the referrals, like at what point is it going to tip? We believe next year that one case manager would be uh, appropriate <laughs> um, and, and it's necessary. Okay, do you want to go to the uh, back page of this? Because Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. Okay. I didn't see any hands. No, it's okay. Um, I guess this is like a little bit of a forward-looking question, but given how many more students anecdotally we're seeing with mental health issues, I'm just curious as you're looking at hardness, how much you might anticipate spillover into special ed, IEP, Bible school services because kids have worse anxiety, worse depression, or maybe need more placements out even temporarily. I mean, maybe that's not hitting Portsmouth directly, but I'm just curious. I, I would say we are seeing that. I guess I personally, <laughs> and with my special ed team, is trying to move the conversation away from every mental health or medical concern is in the special education arena and trying to um, make it more of a general education conversation of how do we best look for our buildings to promote success for all of our students when things are more commonplace of diagnoses. Uh, anxiety being a common one that's occurring across the nation, the state, and certainly in our district, rather than it having to be that our only system of support is special ed, how do we move the conversation to more supports in every building in some fashion, whether that be our counselors and the systems of support, or how do our um, psychologists and BCBA support those teams in a manner that it doesn't have to go through an IEP team, which can be a very restrictive process. So trying to change the conversation a little bit so that it doesn't have to be we're the one stop where you get support. And uh, certainly buildings are open to that conversation. Um, and I would think then that all the costs associated with the needs may not be found in my budgets. It could be that we begin to talk, is that through the guidance budget? Or is that uh, at the middle school, they want to add this particular support system? So I've been really promoting, we're not going to be able to handle what. I guess that's what I was wondering, if you have people like in guidance that are maxed out or psychologists that are maxed out, where do we need to provide more support in the budget so that those needs are being met? You mean from a mental health perspective? Yeah. yeah. Because the one thing that they don't IEP the does, IEPs do provide is some accountability, right? Because they yeah. you can track it. At the, it's like letter to the law. So how yeah. can you build that up where if it's going to be outside that letter to the law accountability, but still have the same case management ability to it? And But there's also criteria to get into special education. I mean, it has to be identified with ability and the need for specially designed instruction. And some mental health services certainly aren't specially designed instruction, there are need for therapeutic supports that uh, aren't best served in an IEP fashion. Uh, for example, a very scripted twice a week, 30 minutes to meet the counselor, it might be better that there's someone a, a student can go to rather than a scripted uh, service related to an IEP goal. So I think you have to have additional resources in addition to arenas. Um, but yes, there is certainly accountability tied to IEP goals. Just some mental health services aren't best served through an IEP process. <laughs> Liz. Oh, yeah. So I'm trying to decipher what is T and F support? I mean, that's a huge chunk, obviously. Well, well, so that's that tuition and fees account that I talked about, and we push dollars over there um, because, because the revenue stream. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's part of the revenue stream of, of 207 because of they're serving all of our students. And so, again, if I go back, historically, the way that it was used was a lot of like high school is where we have our tuition. Students, right, so you've got 380, 381 or 8, 385 SE50 students tuitioning into high school this year, and um, and what was the case historically was that all of the special education services related to the students at SE from SE50 had to be uh, aggregated there so that it could be billed out, and so they pushed all special ed. So, for instance, all of the paras except the one para. I'm not sure why that one para remains, but they pushed all the paras and, and other services, but they. They had to then push general fund dollars over to cover Portsmouth's share of that while they then build for the rest to get reimbursement. So it's um so that's the tuition and fees fund. And, and that 650 is the dollar amount that the last couple of years has been the support that Portsmouth pushes in to cover all those pairs, et cetera. Okay, so the tuition and fees support that would be in this category would go towards paras uh in the high school paras there's some teachers there there's a there's a, a, 
another piece of um, uh, psychologist that was covered by Medicaid, because Medicaid is another revenue stream that falls into this tuition fees fund. Okay. Mago, um, Mago. 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 so because we have to have a conversation about Esther at some point as a board, if, if you were to look at a three-year horizon for special ed, what do you, I, I hear you saying case manager is gonna come up. I hear you saying, not gonna see a decline in occupational therapy, speech therapy. It, three year horizon, what would we need to continue to deliver the best services as well as buffer in this trending of increasing? No, I mean, yes, we'd love to get to the point where numbers of IEPs sure. are declining, but let's assume that numbers continue to trend. What, what would that look like for you? So uh, I think, uh, Related to thinking of it outside of special ed, those early interventions around any mental health supports, anxiety, depression, phobias that we're seeing really impact student success uh, would be key in all of our buildings to have some systems of support, uh, as well as um, supporting family needs. So, um, uh, social worker, I think, is in the budget under wellness. Um, what we have seen related to special ed, but also anecdotally, I've heard outside of special ed are families that have children in multiple buildings and the multiple contacts by the, for example, counselors in each buildings can become confusing for a family that is having a guidance counselor at the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level contact them to try to provide support. It becomes overwhelming. So one contact person for those types of situations would be very helpful. Um, so uh, family supports and then mental health supports. And I, I think I would be echoed across each building with saying that. Thanks. Liz. Is there an opportunity to build in a parent liaison? I know there may have been talk about it with courts and housing, but is there an opportunity to build that in? And would that be part of um, the special ed budget or? So I think there's discussion of a social worker with that idea being a piece of it outside of the special ed budget in the wellness budget, if I'm correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the ESSA funds would be paying for some of the services to take care of the mental health issues. Yeah, when we talk about the ESSA funds, we'll want to talk about where do we move them to best fit, but a number of the things, mental health issues. And so that would provide for counselors. I think I would add trainings of our existing staff um, would be helpful as well in all mental health arenas. <laughs> oh, you were certainly and have had trauma informed trainings, and but I think it goes that's one piece. Uh, so professional development for staff and working with uh, students of a variety of majors would also be a useful source of that money. <laughs> Okay, um, Janet, is there any, we have 15 minutes left. Would you, is there anything you want to cover on these uh, um, things that you gave us? Um, at the top of the other notes page, so the second page, um, I know we've come up a little bit now, IDA funds, generally stable, but really haven't increased the generally because I've been here and they're at that $600,000 mark. Um, so right under 600 and now it's right over, but it really hasn't jumped with that cost of expenses there. Um, uh, there's a whole Medicaid sheet, but a lot less revenue. It is under 200,000 for the last year and projected for this year, whereas at some point we're getting close to $600,000 on a regular basis. Um, and maintenance of effort, I just point out in that special ed is an area that there's rules that you can't spend less than you spent the year before. And uh, they can run the formula with all kinds of checks and balances to make sure that we always are locally spending the same or increasing every year. And that's a requirement um, that we have to meet in order to receive our IDA federal funds. Um, I just updated the caseloads that are throughout here. <laughs> and I put that chart in with the students with the IEPs because I had given you numbers in November. <laughs> um, and so just to show you kind of how it changed in the last three months, and that's always pluses and minuses. Uh, so some buildings slightly up, some buildings slightly down. Um, but I just thought that was a good, I would say, it's a snapshot in time. If I took it even now on the 18th versus the 12th, some numbers could be slightly changed. Um, and then the Medicaid to Schools overview. This is generally what you got last year with a couple of updates. Uh, <laughs> uh, number five, 
on the process for potential reimbursement. There was um, some additional caveats put in that the orders that are signed by a qualified medical provider now requires an MPI number, which is a natural national provider identification. You may know better than me what that acronym stands for because it's a medical term. And they have to be registered in the New Hampshire Medicaid system. So even our staff that our school staff that are um, able to provide an order now have to go through two additional processes in order to fill out the paperwork necessary. So it just added one more layer. And as I said, we do contract with the provider as well for those that we can't get that consent or we don't have a staff member. We do have a process to get some orders signed. And then uh, at the bottom, more largest areas of revenue loss. I actually just went out. They, they, there was they were saying like we couldn't backfill if we didn't have everything in order. And they have gotten a little looser on that with the latest memos that have come up in the last couple of months that we can go back up to a year to get an order signed. So that was a little bit of a relief point that's different for those returning members that's not on this sheet. And then the out of district overview is really just a description of all the processes that go in place and those determinations. Um, and the type of students that may, uh, yeah, can have a district placement based on the team's recommendation. Who's doing your billing? A Medicaid billing? We use an easy Medicaid process. So my assistant is the one that it puts it all in, but we contract with uh, easy high Medicaid billing in order to submit it. Um, and my assistant does a large portion of the actual input of the information and the tracking of the document and it's quite a bit of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just curious, like with the um, time investment, and not that I want to like cut this income revenue, but the time investment, is it, does it pay out um, for just the person doing the building and the salary and the time that they're? That plus certainly the, um, look at the processes on the school side, there's a lot of time to go in and enter things like logs that are going to submit their time. Uh, it certainly was not at all a question when we were bringing in five to six hundred thousand dollars. We are hoping that it continues to increase and get up there. Uh, right now, that's that's a, a good question. <laughs> at, at that less than two hundred thousand dollar mark, we have not sat and figured out cost of my assistant, the cost of the speech therapist that uses a certain amount per hour to do this, the cost of the OG. Um, I think we can still make money um, in the current scenario, but it's not near what we used to. With a greater burden on the staff that are correct, uh, uh, the stress, <laughs> yeah, the stress level increase. We talk of they, there's concern sometimes when we make a joke that we don't want to do anything that will make us in medical detail <laughs> because if there are rules and processes and you have to you run background checks on every provider to make sure that they haven't committed Medicaid fraud in the past. And so it's, it's quite a process. <laughs> Liz. I guess I was curious. Um, uh, you know, obviously we haven't made a move with Robert Lister Academy yet, um, um over to the uh, community campus. But I guess I wondered if, you know, obviously a lot of these schools are specialized or you know they're um, uh, residential programs. But is there ever an opportunity to, you know, or is there a, a, a visible opportunity in the future to offer more services or have services uh, at that location? Um, uh, the ability to expand more to actually include some of these kids that would otherwise go to um, a more specialized school um, or expand to offer um, like uh, some middle school services there versus a specialized school. Uh, we certainly have had those conversations and it's uh, dependent on the profile of the student because Lister serves a very um, particular profile of student. We have brought up the conversation of middle school at the last point we visited that there weren't uh, enough students for the cost of the increase in staffing that would be able to bring one or two students back that would negate that. It's a continual conversation with the move to a new location. There's more opportunities for how can that potentially expand, whether it's under the title Lister or additional programs that could be more centralized. Right now, the students that are in here, there's enough of those diversity of needs, uh, for example, at the elementary level that you couldn't take those students back and run a program because there might be a medical need for a placement, uh, need related to autism for a placement, and need related to behavioral need that it's not every student that has a high level of need is the same need to address in one location. Okay. One that is things, continually revisited. Yeah, and I would just piggyback on that. One of the things in the move, potential move to community campus in having more space to utilize, we had conversations about programs like uh, there's a little program, Kittery Academy, it's a tutoring based model. Um, it's not necessarily a long-term placement, it's sometimes a short-term need. 
uh, and we spend money sending students to that, whereas we may want to set up a parallel program within community campus that would actually interface with Lister Academy and serve some of these more intermittent uh, acute needs and would certainly need to say that this is what that. Any other questions? <clears throat> I Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. You are you are you are wow. Wow. I love doing this when you're here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, well, um, why don't we just take a five minute break and we'll be at 8.30. I'm going to for a break. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, okay. May I have a mouth close? <laughs> so, okay. Marco first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Well, it's the, uh, but it's the, uh, I don't know what she's got. I, it's Samsung, so it's a, uh, it's one of those uh, Android jacks. I'll, I'll look when I go out. If it's an old one, it's the USB. It's the USB. It's the USB. Yeah. I'll try. You know what? I think it's lightning. It sounds like a horror show. I've been here. Yeah. That was great.